What's up with the hats? Okay, Pasta and Mason Bro. Well, we are wearing these hats to let you know that this coming Saturday, May 5th, Cinco de Mayo, the Guatemalan missions team will be holding a benefit dinner. Uh, where's it going to be held, Marty? It's going to be held at the St. Albans Historical Museum. At 5 o'clock on Saturday. So that's Cinco de Mayo. Now, where are all the women going to be on that day? They're going to be at the women's retreat. So, men, who's going to cook for you? We, we are. are. We're going to have bunches of Mexican food. Uh, Carolina will be selling tickets in the lobby between services. So come on down and uh, have a good time with us. Hasta, Hasta luego! luego. On January the 1st, 1929, halfway through the second quarter of the Rose Bowl, a player named Roy Regals made a play that would never ever be forgotten. Forever after, he would be known as Roy Wrong, Wrong Way Regals. Regals was playing defense for the University of California when uh, Georgia Tech fumbled the ball. Uh, they were down deep in their own territory, just about their own 30-yard line. And so Regals scooped it up and started running. What happened next remained a mystery to Regals for the rest of his life. Let me read you his own words. I was running toward the sidelines when I picked up the ball. I started to turn to my left toward Tech's goal. Somebody shoved me and I bounded right off into a tackler. In pivoting to get away from him, I completely lost my bearings. I guess he lost them. He ran 69 yards in the wrong direction. <laughs> His teammates were screaming for him to turn around. The, uh, the Georgia Tech sideline was going crazy and the coach frantically begged his players to just stop making noise and said, just let him keep going the way he's going. <laughs> don't, don't get his attention. Well, finally, one of his own players caught up with him at the three-yard line just before he would have run into the end zone to make a safety. And uh, he tried to turn him around, but by then, of course, the Georgia Tech players were there, so they tackled him on the one. And the next play... California attempted a punt to get out of this terrible pickle and the punt was blocked meaning that Georgia Tech scored two points so now the score was 2-0 at the end of the game the score was 8-7 Georgia Tech and the difference was one wrong way run that put those two points on the board that would have been the difference for a national championship now the crowd listening to Peter preach on Pentecost Sunday was in the same situation as Roy Regal's when he scooped up the ball and started running. They were running as hard as they could. These were serious people. They took their religion seriously. They took God seriously. They took their, their loyalty to God's word seriously. Uh, they weren't just out looking to make trouble. They were trying to get it right. And they were running as hard as they could. Problem was they were running in the wrong direction. Now, the goal of an ardent and loyal Jewish person in the time of Jesus was to demonstrate to God that they were faithful partners in this long-standing covenant between God and his people. And I try to understand, if you had been born Jewish, you're living in that time, you understood that you were already God's chosen people. You didn't have to earn the status of being chosen. It was already done. You were God's chosen people. You think about when you're born into a family. You, know, you don't have to earn uh, the title son or daughter. It kind of comes with a birth certificate. Uh, it's just, that just happened. Now, you might be a good son or a good daughter, or you might be a lousy son or a lousy daughter, but it doesn't change the fact that you're already in the family. And when God created this covenant with his people, he made them part of his family. He said, we're in this covenant relationship. So they knew they were chosen. <clears throat> the challenge was to show to God that they were holding up their end of the bargain. So doing good things and showing God that they were serious and loyal and faithful was not an attempt to earn salvation. They already had it. It was an attempt to show God that they were being faithful to this arrangement and that he could then bring the blessings that would come when he honored his side of the agreement. So here they were running. Their whole lives were dedicated toward, to showing God their faithfulness to their side of this covenant relationship. And their goal was to show God that they were 100 percenters. They were committed. They were zealous. 
they would come through on their end of the bargain and then God could come through on his end and get rid of these nasty Romans and get rid of all of the oppression in their lives and establish his kingdom. For example, hadn't they just recently gotten rid of a false prophet named Jesus of Nazareth? One more pretender who came into town saying he was God's king. Didn't God's word tell them what to do with these kinds of pretenders, these people who misled the people? Back in Deuteronomy 13.5, Moses had said, that prophet or dreamer, this false prophet or a false dreamer, must be put to death for inciting rebellion against the Lord your God. So they had done their religious duty by putting Jesus before Pilate to be crucified on a Roman cross. It wasn't just a smear campaign, a hate campaign. It wasn't just that somebody had some personal grudge against Jesus or his disciples. They really thought they were doing the right thing. They scooped up the ball when they saw it on the turf, and they started running. And they were running with all of their might, thinking they were doing the thing that would show to God that they were the real deal. But now as Peter finishes his sermon, a sermon, a message in which he's describing Jesus of Nazareth as God's king and as the Lord present, it suddenly dawns on them that they've been running the wrong way. In Acts chapter 2, verse 37, this is right at the end of the message, we read these words, When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? What shall we do? Certainly many of these people that were present at, for this message were some of the same people who were standing in Pilate's courtyard on Good Friday morning. Pilate came out, if you read Luke's account, Luke wrote the book of Acts, he wrote the book of Luke, so you, the two talked to each other in some powerful ways. And when Luke, Luke tells us that when Jesus was arrested and he was brought to Pilate, with the demand on the part of the, of the Jewish leaders that, he, that Jesus be put to death, Pilate conducted a little trial. In fact, he did a trial, then he sent Jesus to Herod, the, the little puppet king, and had him do a little trial, and the two men both agreed, this guy is innocent. Well, okay, we're going to have him, have him scourged because he's caused a, a disturbance. You get yourself in, you know, you create some trouble, we'll make some trouble for you, but he's not worthy of being put to death. So Pilate came out and said, I find no fault with this guy. He's innocent. How about if I just let him go? Well, the crowd went crazy. And they said, no, we don't want him. We want a man named Barabbas, who was a known murderer and rebel. Ah, you say, well, why would they choose a murderer over Jesus? Well, because the rebel had been conducting a, a, a kind of... Uh, um, uh, a rebellion against the Romans as a demonstration of his faithfulness to God. It was not just that this guy was out to, you know, kill people and, and create havoc. Barabbas' attack against the Romans was religiously motivated and was saying, look God, this is how zealous I am. So here these people were having to choose between Jesus, an innocent man, and Barabbas, a known rebel, and they say, well, we'll go with the rebel because that will show God how in incredibly devoted we are to seeing him be victor and no one else. Pilate came back two more times and said, the guy's innocent. I can't put him to death. I, there's no cause. And the crowd just yelled, crucify him, crucify him. Finally, fearing a riot and not wanting to lose control of things in that city during a huge feast day with perhaps 200,000 people in town, Pilate gave in. It says he surrendered to their will. And Jesus was led off to the cross. But now, all of a sudden, this crowd that thought it was so right that it could kill an innocent man, this crowd suddenly realized that they had gotten the whole thing wrong. Even Pilate, a Roman pagan, could see that they were running the wrong way. You see, Pilate was one of those going, turn around, <laughs> turn around. But they hadn't listened. They had put the Messiah to death. The person they were looking for, the person they were saying, God, if we're faithful, you'll send a Messiah, the person they thought had all their hopes pinned upon was the very one they'd put on the cross. Did that mean there was no further hope for them? 
Had they missed their chance? Or could there possibly be one more chance to turn around? Brothers, what shall we do? What do we do now? Where do I turn? You ever been in one of those moments where maybe you thought you were doing the right thing and then suddenly you realize to your horror, oh, I've been wrong the whole way. I, I've got, I have too many of those moments. I mean, it would be a question of which one to pick. Because as I've said before, we make our biggest mistakes when we think we're right. When we know we're wrong and we're going to do it anyway, we do it with a guilty conscience. We don't do it with a whole lot of zeal. We kind of like hope that we can kind of get away with it. But oh, get out of the way when we know we're right. When we know we're right, you know, we unload. You, maybe some of you have unloaded on someone who was in the wrong and you were in the right and you got up on your little soapbox and you let them have it. There is nothing more empowering in the moment than unloading with all of your passion and all of your anger and saying, and I am morally correct here and you are wrong. Maybe you've been on the other end of that <laughs> and you've seen that finger coming like this at you and you realize, whoa, because it, when you know you've got it right, or you think you do, it's, there are no restraints. You're like Roy Regals running down the field. The more his team yelled, turn around, the more he heard, go for it and ran harder. So what do you do when suddenly you discover, oh, I was totally wrong in doing that. I went and corrected that person and I read them the riot act and everything blew up and if I just kept my mouth shut, none of this would have happened. <laughs> Is there any hope for that relationship? Whatever the situation might be, what do we do next? I'm kind of intrigued by the way that the crowd addresses Peter, because they say, brothers, brothers. It's not an us versus them, is it? All of a sudden, they're saying, we need your help. Uh, you're one of us, and you, you, know, you may have gotten it wrong too, but you found your way, and maybe you could help us here. Well, Peter's answer, what do you do next, is right to the point. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter replied, repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. When Suzanne and I went to Scotland, I, we had the wonderful opportunity of riding on the left side of the road for a week. Anybody, how many of you have done that? Isn't that the, one of the great things in life, right? Riding on the left side of the road instead of the right side of the road. Uh, I only got into the car on the passenger side about 30 times, and my wife would be sitting there, and I'd go, oops, excuse me, walk around the car. Yeah. And uh, I did fine for the most part. The last day, the last morning, getting up early in the morning before dawn, getting in the car, all I had to do was get to the airport. And that only meant going through two or three traffic circles. And these were complicated traffic. These are in Edinburgh. These are big traffic circles. And they had little ramps that let you get on the, on the uh, circle or off the circle. And in that pre-dawn hour, there I was, the rental car, just thinking, Five more miles, and there's no more left-hand side of the road. And I came up to this traffic circle, and there was a nice little ramp off to the right. And I mean, instinctively, I started. And the minute I got into that ramp, cars started stopping everywhere. I mean, it was sort of like somebody hit a button. It was like, ah! And I, and I looked, and then all of a sudden, it's like, ah! I'm going the wrong way around the traffic circle. I had not gotten out onto the circle yet. Thank. I was in the little ramp. I stopped. <laughs> I put the car in reverse. I backed out of the little ramp. There wasn't any traffic at that point, And zoomed off in the other direction. In other words, I repented. <laughs> That's called repenting. I was stabbed to the heart. <laughs> I said to myself, what shall I do? <laughs> I said, I'm going to back up and get out of here. <laughs> I was looking for blue lights. I was like, oh, thank you. There were no cops around. And, you know, we got to the airport. I parked the car. Bye-bye. And yeah, until the next time, you know, that's what you do. You repent. You're going the wrong way. There was nothing to be gained by saying, well, maybe I'll just keep going and see how this works out. It wasn't going to work out. <laughs> it was going to be like dodge them on a traffic circle in downtown 
Edinburgh, no, not good. You back up. And that's what Peter was telling people there. Said, oh, you're running the wrong way. Okay, there's one thing to do. Turn around. When? Now. <laughs> Don't think about it. Turn around. <laughs> it's not going to get any better if you keep doing what you do. If you just sit where you are, that's not going to fix anything. This isn't going to change. You know, oh, give me a couple of months. To, no, you're going the wrong way. Turn around now. The sooner you turn around, the less damage you do, and the quicker you get to where you're supposed to be. A radical, radical change. That's what the word repent means. It means in the Greek language to change your mind. Oh, just, you're thinking this way, you're thinking this way. In the Hebrew language, which is much more down to earth, it simply meant you're walking one way and you turn around and walk the other way. You just do an about face. Now Peter went on and he said, repent and be baptized. These are two ways of doing the same thing. He challenged his listeners to demonstrate this radical change of direction by being baptized. Now they were familiar with this idea of baptism. It was something that was done in the Jewish faith when you converted to Judaism. It was something John the Baptist did, obviously, John the Baptist. People came out and he said, repent and be baptized. They went into the Jordan River. The word baptized means to be immersed. It was what you would do. It was a word that was used to describe what you would do if you were dyeing a piece of cloth where you would take it and completely dip it uh, and submerge it in a fluid. And so he says, come out and be baptized. By so doing, they were demonstrating that they were leaving the old behind, taking a brand new direction. And where John did this at the beginning of the gospel stories was out in the desert. He's basically, as we've talked about this before, he was saying, start your new exodus. Let your baptism be your Red Sea where you leave Egypt behind where you go into that water and you come out a different person. And so Peter says, yes, there is a second chance for you. Yes, this can be done right now. It doesn't matter how badly you got it wrong on Good Friday. It doesn't matter what you thought of this Jesus. You can turn around now. The game isn't over. You still have the ball. You can run in the right direction. To be baptized in Jesus' name or in the name of Jesus Christ, meant to become a follower of Jesus. It meant to completely identify yourself with Jesus. That his story becomes your story. His reality becomes your reality. Paul explains that this means a radical and complete identification with Jesus in both his death and his resurrection. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, have a little explanation of baptism that Paul gives to us. He says, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Being baptized is a way of acting out a decision to say, Jesus' story is my story. That when Jesus died, he died for me and I died with him. I died to my old life. I died to those old failures. I died to those sins that I could never get rid of myself. And when Jesus was raised from the dead, I was raised with him. I'm already experiencing God's new life in my earthly body, in my spirit. Paul goes so far as to say to the church in Ephesus, you are seated with Christ in the heavenlies. Well, I look around, no we're not, we're a church of the rock on a rainy day. But our spirits are already seated in a place of ruling in God's kingdom. And Paul's saying that to ordinary Christians just like you and me. Why? Well, we're seated there because Jesus is seated there. Whatever is true for Jesus is true for us. And Paul said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Being baptized, you see, for early Christians was the defining mark that you were a follower of Jesus Christ. And it should be that for us as well today. Uh, on Mother's Day, we're going to be having a baptismal service here. I want to encourage you as you listen to this message and as you think about what it means to be a follower of Jesus, uh, to ask, you know, to, to consider being baptized if you have not yet been baptized of your own choice. And many of us in this room have been baptized as infants. I was as a Presbyterian. My mom was Presbyterian. My dad was 
Baptist, so I was baptized twice. Once for the Presbyterian side, once for the Baptist side. Uh, my mom picked out the first one, I chose the second one. And uh, they worked together. I mean, I'm not, I'm thankful for my mother's desire that I belong to God's family. And um, I'm very blessed to any of us that have been baptized as babies because our parents wanted us to be followers of Jesus. But what Peter's talking about here is our making our own choice. He says, repent and be baptized every one of you. You go make a choice as to whether you're going to be a follower of Jesus or not. And I want to encourage you to uh, be thinking and praying about that and to be in contact. Call the office or you can talk to me. And we're going to be having that service on, uh, on Mother's Day. Uh, we have it typically right at the end of the serv service, right after the sermon. And uh, you may want to invite your family and friends uh, to come and, let, and see what it is that you're doing as a follower of Jesus. Now, repenting and bapti being baptized meant to this desperate crowd that there was a second chance. Peter said, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. You see, when you choose to identify with Jesus, then his death becomes your death. And that means for this crowd that they could die to the crime of having put Jesus to death. The greatest crime of all, that they were on the wrong side of welcoming God's Messiah. Peter said, you know what? We can make that all go away. You can be on the right side, just, but you're going to need to die to that old life. There's no way to put the two of those in the same package. Instead of living under condemnation and guilt, they could now gain the good standing with God they longed for. Now remember, these were people who were saying, okay, God chose us, we're in this covenant, but we need to show God that we're faithful. Well, they showed it the wrong way by putting to death his faithful servant, Jesus. And now, Paul, uh, Peter says, but now you have a chance to repent for that failure, for getting it wrong, and to become a follower of Jesus Messiah, Jesus the King. And when you do that, then all of the blessings of that, of that agreement, that covenant, come to pass. You know, the greatest blessing of that covenant was that the old sins would be forgiven. The old failures, the sins, were ways in which the covenant was, was breached. Ways in which someone didn't keep up their end of the deal. And so, when you don't keep up your end of the deal, then the penalties apply as opposed to the blessings. And as long as those, those penalties are there, the covenant can't be a good thing for you. Think about what it's like when you buy a car. And uh, so you're supposed to make payments. Well, you're in a covenant. Uh, we got a contract, or whatever we call it, but it's a covenant. And the covenant works like this. You make payments, they let you have car. Bank lets you have car, right? So, hey, every week, every month, you make payment, you make your payment every month, you drive to work, you have this car. It's your car, even though the bank kind of really has the title. And uh, that's your covenant. Until you finish paying that thing off, that's the deal. Well, you get behind on your payments, you start getting letters. One day you go out to get your car and <laughs> no car. How do you get rid of that? Well, the way you get rid of that is you've got to wipe away all of those back payments, all of those sins against that covenant. Now, when it came to the covenant between humans and God, we can't do that on our own. We can't go back and undo the failures of the past. Peter's audience couldn't go back and say, oh, oh yeah, 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 you're right. Jesus is Messiah. He's already been crucified. It, it was something that happened in history. It was a, 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 finished, a finished fact. And nothing they could do could change that. But God said, but I can do something you can't do. I reversed your verdict of guilty upon him. I raised him from the dead. And I'm going to give you a chance now to become part of that new life. And you know what? If you choose to believe in him, then his death becomes the payment for all of those failures and sins. And that's what God offers to you and to me. We're in that same situation. What shall we do? What shall we do, Lord? What do I do if I've messed up my life in some area? What do I do if I've messed up my relationship with, a, with a, one of my children? Or I've messed up my relationship with my spouse? Or I've messed up my relationship at work? Or I've abused myself and, I, and, and, uh, and I, maybe I'm suffering from some sort of life-controlling situation. What do I do? What do I do if I've suddenly discovered that when I thought I was doing the right thing, I was actually doing 
the wrong thing. We can't go back and change it. We can't go back and rewrite uh, the script. Uh, one of the... Uh, <laughs> One of the bittersweet things about getting older is that you look back on so many situations that could have been different and you ask yourself, oh, if only I could have gone back, but you know what? No, I don't really want to go back there again. And you kind of realize life now is because of what we chose then. And God comes to us, each and every one of us, and he says, when you become a follower of Jesus, you die to that old life and I can take the old and I can make it into something brand new you see turning around means more than just being saved from something it means being saved for something Peter says at, at the end of his sermon verses 38 8 and 39 he says repent and be baptized and then he says and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit the promise is for you and for your children and to all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Oh boy, if there was one thing Peter's listeners were looking for, it was the day when God would bring his peace, that shalom, it would just rest upon the land. It wouldn't just be a time of nothing happening. It'd be a time of fruitfulness and happiness and joy and security. Everything that we all long for in our lives, everything we want to be true of our home, of our relationship with our loved ones, everything we want to be true in our finances and in our personal health and what we want for our community, it would be peace. They knew that that would only come when the covenant was fulfilled and God would come in all of his power and would establish his kingdom. They believed that when God came as king, he would dwell in the temple and all of his glory and the whole world would be drawn to Jerusalem. Read your Old Testament and you see time and time and time again that, that hope, that longing being expressed. Well, now Peter says something very startling. He says that when you repent and when you're baptized, not only are your sins forgiven, but God comes to live inside of you. You become the temple. You become the place where the shalom, the peace, the rest the mighty, wonderful, healing, creative power of God comes to rest. It's not just going to be in a building, Peter's saying. And he's probably standing right in the temple enclosure at that time as he's preaching. That's where I picture this happening. He's saying, it's not just going to be here. It's going to be here that God comes to rest. Just like he did this morning on Pentecost. Look how he filled these people. He's going to do that for you. The covenant between God and his people won't just be temporarily renewed until somebody messes up again. He said it has been completely transformed into what it was meant to be. Emmanuel, God with us. And God with us means new life. It means new creation. In a later message that Peter preaches in this temple, chapter 3, verse 19, this is what he says, and you'll notice the parallel to the message we've been looking at. Repent then and turn to God. There it is. So that your sins may be wiped out. We just saw that part, right? Repent, be baptized, forgiveness of your sins. Repent and turn to God so your sins may be wiped out. That times of refreshing may come from the Lord. How many could use times of refreshing? <laughs> and that just sounds good, right? And that's a rich, rich concept in God's word. It means that we experience God's new creation right now in this old world, right in our lives. It means we experience his healing and his wholeness in a broken world. It means that we're empowered to join God in his renewal project for his world. Jesus paid the price for our sins. He ushered in God's new creation when the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. This is not just a, a, an idea that sort of sounds neat and has a little ring to it. It's anchored in the fact that Jesus conquered death. That changed the whole equation. But now it's up to you and me to do what Peter's audience was challenged to do. Repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So that this promise, the gift of the Spirit, the gift of God's new creation, the times of refreshing could flow into our lives. And that's what it means when the Bible talks about being saved. When we talk about the fact that Jesus saves us, he saves us from, he saves us 
for. He saves us from our sins, from the past, from the brokenness of the world. And he saves us for being part of God's renewal of that world and rescuing other people, putting the broken pieces back together again. That's what you're here for. That's what I'm here for. We are part of God's construction crew, building God's new creation, building it one conversation at a time, building it one prayer at a time, building it one little insight that God puts in our hearts to see the world God's way rather than our way, one little insight at a time, building God's world one repentance at a time. And believe me, repenting is not just something you do once. You'll have lots of opportunities every day. And when you're going along and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit goes, you're running the wrong way. <laughs> and then we turn around. And maybe we had that crossword with a friend or with a loved one. And then we come back and we go, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I shouldn't have said it that way. Please, I ask your forgiveness. What does the Lord's Prayer say? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive. It's not on the past tense, is it? Because <laughs> it's going to keep happening. We're not all fixed yet. We can still pick up the ball and run the wrong direction. But God promises to be making us part of the solution, not part of the problem. Not just saved from, but saved for. It means having God's Holy Spirit live inside of us. It means learning how to welcome Him the presence of God. I, I'm just still glowing with our 40-day time. And uh, I know what's going to happen on the retreat, ladies. If you haven't signed up, get back there and get your name on the list there. Figure it out because you have a chance to take a little time to learn how to welcome God's Spirit and how to be that place where God not only is present in your life, but He's changing your life and he's talking to you and you're talking to him and you're becoming part of what it means to be saved for. You're God's temple. When we welcome God's spirit into our hearts, our deserts become God's garden. Our failures become God's victories. Our weakness becomes God's strength. But only if we turn around. Can we bow our heads together? And ask our team to come up. If we could just bow our heads for a moment. Father, I just want to pray for anyone here who is sensing in their spirit right now the tugging of the Holy Spirit to turn around. It may be in terms of just some, some interaction that happened over the last 24 hours. It may be in terms of, a, of an attitude, or maybe a deeply seated uh, attitude uh, towards someone else. Maybe a long-standing grudge that, or inability to forgive that has just sort of been there like a big rock in the middle of the highway and it just needs to go. Needs to be cleared out. It may be that most basic decision to stop trying to figure it out on our own and to begin, become a follower of Jesus. Realize that this is the time. This is the time to repent. Be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. To start a whole brand new life. Father, I pray you would speak to any person here right now who knows there's something that needs to be made right. And you're not asking us to fix it. You're asking us to turn so that you can come and you can make it right. Lord, I thank you that you didn't put the load on us so that if we could somehow crack the code, figure it out, get our act together, then, then you would see how great we are and then would join us in become part of our experience. Instead, you just said, turn around. <laughs> you just admit it's not working. Admit you're wrong. Turn around. And then you've promised to swoop in the good shepherd coming to, to bring us home. 
So I just pray, Lord, out over everyone in this place right now. I'm sure there's some area in each of our lives where repenting needs to happen. It's a kind of daily thing. And especially for those who need to make that big choice, become a follower of Jesus. Your word says that you call us. We would never figure it out on our own. So help us hear your voice. Help us hear your voice, Lord. Let's stand together and ask the prayer team to come down. We have a few minutes here. I'm just going to encourage you, just keep your head bowed or just keep yourself in God's presence. And If you have a need for prayer, you know, I would love to pray with you here at the front. Or if you have a need where you are and there's someone there next to you that can pray for you, just lean over to them and ask them to pray for you. Take your hand. But let's do some work with God right now. Any way that we're running the wrong way. Whether we know it or not. Let's just clear the slate right now. Why leave one thing out of place when God has done everything to make it right? Thank you, Lord.